Bonjour, bienvenue à un autre rendez-vous quotidien pour la presse en ligne et en direct sur EBS. Nous sommes aujourd'hui le lundi 4 janvier 2021. Tout d'abord, j'aimerais vous souhaiter une très bonne année à toutes et à tous et évidemment une bonne santé pour cette année qui s'ouvre. Et si personnellement, j'ai un souhait très personnel, c'est que nous puissions réouvrir la salle de presse le plus rapidement possible et c'est ce que nous essaierons de faire dès que les conditions sanitaires le permettront. Mais entre temps, nous continuerons avec notre système virtuel à essayer de répondre du mieux possible à vos questions. Voilà, nous avons une unique annonce aujourd'hui pour vous concernant la préservation de notre patrimoine culturel et l'innovation numérique dans les écoles. Et je passe la parole à Johannes. Merci Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, thank you. Um, yes, the Commission has today launched uh, some interesting projects in the areas of cultural heritage and digital digital education. Uh, first, a competence center which aims at preserving and protecting European cultural heritage. The center has been granted up to 3 million euros from Horizon 2020. It will enable access to data, metadata and guidelines, bringing together expertise from various academic disciplines in the area of uh, cultural heritage and cultural heritage preservation. Uh, second, we also launched two projects to support digital education worth up to 1 million euros each, also through Horizon 2020. One is a mentoring project that aims to mobilize 120 schools in six member states, Belgium, Czechia, Croatia, Italy, Hungary and Portugal, as well as the UK, to advance digital innovation, in particular in small or rural schools and for socially disadvantaged students. And the other projects will allow for the creation of regional innovation hubs and also mentoring This involves 600 teachers in 75 schools in Estonia, Finland, Italy and Lithuania, but also Georgia, Norway, Norway and the UK. And as always, you'll find more information in the daily news. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. This brings us to the end of our announcements and we will now therefore take your questions. I pass the floor to Athanasios. Athanasios, welcome back. To all, happy new year. Uh, I got a simple question that has to do with all that we've been hearing uh, in the last couple of weeks. Is the president happy with the uh, vaccination strategy so far? And I mean, the implementation part and the vaccine acquisition part as well. Because, you know, there is a lot of complaining. We are too slow, we are too fast, we get too much, we got too little, all that stuff. How do you answer to all that stuff, to all those complaints? And uh, what's the opinion of the president on, on the whole operation so far? Thanks. Thank you very much, Athanasios. Um, well, as you know, the, uh, the commission has very, very early on um, understood that uh, both the acquisition of vaccines and the vaccination process would be major endeavors uh, for the European Union and that it was key that uh, the European Union act in a, a cohesive um, manner in this respect because we are a united continent, we have freedom of movement, of people, of goods, etc. And therefore, uh, it is extremely important that we have a vaccine a vaccination strategy that um, encompasses the whole of the European Union. We've had many, many opportunities here in the press room to describe to you um, how the process was moving forward and indeed continues to move um, forward. The president um, in a press conference uh, just before the uh, G20 uh, summit last autumn explained to you um, what the state of play was on the vaccination process and how we were looking forward to the process um, being rolled out as the new year uh, begins. So we are obviously very much focused on ensuring that the implementation of our strategy um, uh, is done, is done well, and that uh, all the actors, including obviously the member states, play their part in this. So quite frankly, it's still early days. 
as you know, we have signed a certain number of contracts. We've signed six contracts. We have approval of uh, one and hopefully very soon approval of a second vaccine and further vaccines uh, later on. And of course, the coming weeks and months will be very important uh, in terms of the rollout of, uh, of this vaccination. So we are very, very focused on making sure that it works well. It's obvious that such a complex endeavor is always going to bring with it um, uh, difficulties, that there will always be bumps on the road, but we are confident that with all the efforts that we have put in, we will be able to ensure vaccination of um, Europeans as quickly as possible. Are there other questions for us on this issue today? Please only keep your hand raised if it is on this, um, on this issue. I see many hands raised. Um, please only keep your hand raised if it is on vaccination or vaccines. I let you a bit of time and I see that uh, EP has a question. Hello, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you, go ahead. Yes, we hear you, go ahead. Happy New Year and thank you for the question. I, I have um, two questions. Uh, one is um, about uh, activities uh, Commission is doing at the moment, for example, to fasten somehow uh, the, the amounts of uh, vaccines coming to the States. Are there something going on, some kind of uh, negotiations to have bigger amounts or maybe um, negotiations to, to have like bigger production facilities or doing something. And another question about this uh, critics about um, being too slow. Do you, do you agree that um, Commission and European Union was uh, too slow uh, and uh, too very, uh, little ambitious uh, concerning, for example, uh, the deal with uh, Pfizer and BioNTech? Thank you very much. I will pass the floor to Stefan. Thank you very much, Ep. First, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Okay, and yes, also from my side, especially a healthy uh, 2021. Um, two questions. Um, first, on what is the Commission doing or what are we doing with regards to uh, the discussions on, on uh, the, the deliveries of doses and so on? Um, um, I, I think one of the one of the main bottlenecks that we are all experiencing now is the the production capacity. Of course, this is a very uh, important bottleneck that we are all facing ourselves, and uh, the Commission is of course in contact with the different uh, with the different producers with the member states to see how things can be improved. I would like to draw your attention also to the fact that part of the contracts that have been concluded with these companies foresee in actual support by the Commission to develop this production capacity. Um, your second question is has to do with um, were we too slow and have we and secondly have we not ordered not enough doses? Let me start with the second part. Um, uh, the European Union has managed to develop a very diversified portfolio of almost two billion doses. You have to know that this uh, portfolio has been developed on a time of big uncertainty when we were negotiating these contracts with these six companies and also with uh, other companies. When we were negotiating these, there was no certainty whatsoever that any of these vaccines would be considered safe and effective by the European Medicines Agency. So we were acting in the context of an important uncertainty. In order to cover this, the main philosophy of the strategy was to develop a diversified portfolio, investing and, 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 and reserving doses from different companies using different technologies, thereby increasing the chance that at least one or even more of these vaccines uh, would be uh, considered safe and effective at a later stage. And that's exactly what we've done. And we've developed a very wide and diversified portfolio exactly to do this. We don't put all our eggs in one basket, but uh, we want to increase uh, our chances. And that's what we've been doing that in a context of uncertainty from the beginning. Um, 
Your other question, were we too, uh, were we too late? I would say rather on the contrary, the, the EU vaccine strategy was already adopted and approved and endorsed at the highest level by the heads of state in June. Again, working in a, in a, in a, on a moment that um, there was no certainty about any of these uh, vaccine um, uh, developments. I would like to draw your attention also to the fact that, for instance, when it comes to BioNTech Pfizer, we had already introduced or invested in, um, in this company well before uh, it became clear that the vaccine that was developed by the company would uh, be successful. So we have been, from the beginning, been very open to develop a, a, a portfolio which is as broad as possible, investing in companies to make sure that we have this uh, production capacity. Thank you. Thank you. I move to Yanis. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Yanis. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, also on the vaccine, I wanted to ask, is there a frustration in the Commission about the fact that uh, EMA seems to be taking a lot longer with the AstraZeneca vaccine than, than other regulatory authorities? We've heard that it's unlikely that it will be approved uh, in within January. Um, is there frustration that some member states had not done the necessary preparatory work uh, for the rollout and thus you know, days have gone by and, and have they vaccinated very few people? And could the Commission have done something more to help uh, to help them along in that? And is there has a discussion begun um, with ECDC or EMA uh, as as it has in other countries about possibly moving to a one dose reg regimen or pushing the second dose a lot further into the future so as to get more people uh, vaccinated in the early stages? Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Many questions uh, there. I pass the floor back to Stefan. Thank you very much, Yanis. I will go backwards in my questions. The, first, the last question that you asked, I will take first. Are the discussions on using one dose or two dose and so on? This is an, a medical question that I believe is best to be uh, raised with the colleagues from the European Medicines Agency. The question whether it would make sense indeed to go from two doses or, or to one dose. This obviously has medical implications and I think it makes sense to contact the colleagues of um, EMA. Um, as far as um, the vaccination campaigns are concerned, where are we with the vaccination com campaigns? Are we frustrated or not frustrated? I would say that frustration is probably not a, a word in, in, in our vocabulary here. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the Commission already mid-October announced uh, recommendations or adopted recommendations to help member states with the preparation of the vaccination. It contained very practical recommendations on, for instance, identifying in time the priority groups, on making sure the infrastructure is ready, on making sure there are sufficient resources, and so on. And this has been followed up by member states. We are talking with member states about it. The ECDC has made um, a first assessment uh, of the situation already a few weeks ago and is continuing to follow this. Let us not forget that this is an extremely complex um, um, process. This is an, a, a pandemic we have never ever seen uh, in, 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 in the history of the European Union. So this is a very important complex undertaking and we are in contact with the member states to uh, make sure that this, this vaccination is very complex uh, uh, campaigns can take place as well as possible. Uh, as far as the um, uh, recognition or rather the um, authorization of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is concerned and whether there is any frustration with regard to EMA, there is of course no frustration with regard to EMA. We have always said that it is fundamental that the vaccines that are distributed to our European citizens are safe and effective. And secondly, that we can convince our European citizens of the importance of having this vaccination. And this is why member states and the Commission are all of the opinion that it is very important that the vaccines are assessed by the European Medicines Agency, an independent agency of scientists who are extremely well placed to assess effectiveness and quality. And this is exactly what EMA is doing. EMA has sped up its processes, for instance, by applying rolling reviews. Rolling reviews basically means that before companies introduce a request for a vaccination or vaccine authorization, that they can already, before that stage, submit data which may become available. This allows EMA to already assess these data before the official submission of a market authorization request, and it helps EMA 
do a much faster job as soon as the um, um, uh, request is introduced by the company. Of course, the important step that has to be taken as well is that the company has to uh, submit a um, an, an, uh, market authorization request. And in that context, I refer as far as AstraZeneca is concerned to a press release that is, has been published by EMA a few days ago, in which they explain the state of play of this file and the additional information that they have requested from this company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see many hands raised, so let us try to be concise. Um, David. Oui, bonjour, uh, Eric, et, et bonne année à, à vous tous. Um, um, si je peux, deux questions à propos uh, des, des vaccins. Est-ce qu'on peut avoir um, um, un état des lieux, disons, du nombre de vaccins qui ont été uh, distribués jusqu'à maintenant, de doses qui ont été distribuées uh, jusqu'à maintenant uh, aux différents États membres um, Et euh, deuxième question, euh, euh, est-ce que euh, vous êtes en négociation avec BioNTech et Pfizer pour augmenter le nombre de euh, doses euh, au-delà des, euh, des 300 qui, sont, qui ont été déjà annoncées Et euh, est-ce que vous allez faire la même chose avec euh, Moderna Merci. Merci. Stéphane Euh, merci beaucoup, David, aussi à toi, euh, mes meilleurs voeux pour euh, 2021. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, des doses additionnelles pour Moderna et BioNTech Pfizer, euh, pour les deux sociétés, la Commission a décidé de lever l'option pour pouvoir acheter des doses additionnelles, 80 millions dans le cas de Moderna, ce qui donnerait le total de 160 millions, et dans le cas de BioNTech Pfizer, euh, euh, 100 millions additionnels, ce qui donnait euh, un total de 300 millions de doses. Donc, dans le cadre de cette levée, de cette levée, de cet exercice, de cette option, euh, la Commission et les États membres sont en train de, de voir quelles euh, options pourraient être, euh, combien de, de doses en effet devraient être commandées, comment distribuer ces doses dans le cadre euh, de cette option. Donc ça, c'est des discussions qui ont lieu, en, qui sont, qui ont, euh, ont lieu actuellement. Euh, en plus, dans le cadre de BioNTech Pfizer, la Commission est en train de voir avec la société s'il y a moyen d'ajouter des doses additionnelles, euh, additionnelles aux doses qui euh, ont des, sur lesquelles on avait déjà un accord. En ce qui concerne le nombre des, euh, des doses, ce que je peux te dire, c'est que euh, le, en ce qui concerne euh, BioNTech Pfizer, comme tu sais, les premières doses ont été livrées le 26 septembre, des nouvelles livraisons ont eu lieu et continuent à avoir lieu sur base d'un euh, système hebdomadaire de, de, de livraison. La distribution des, des doses euh, prévu pour par euh, BioNTech devrait avoir lieu au plus tard par septembre euh, 2021 euh, et donc nous continuons à suivre avec euh, les États membres avec la société euh, le, la livraison des doses j'attire aussi l'attention sur le fait que les aspects de livraison les lieux de livraison le nombre et le camp des, des livraisons ce sont des choses qui sont euh, négociées ou discutées entre la société et les États membres Donc, je ne peux pas te donner des chiffres euh, sur euh, les États membres. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci. Eric. Entendez Oui, absolument. Oui, absolument. Très bien. Bonne année à tous et merci. à toutes. Euh, moi aussi, j'ai une question concernant euh, les vaccins, évidemment. Alors, dans une interview à la presse allemande, le responsable de BioNTech, Ugo Sahin, s'est montré étonné par la lenteur de la commande de la Commission européenne. Est-ce que vous avez une réaction à cela Et deuxième question, est-ce que les États membres sont intervenus pour défendre leur propre vaccin Est-ce que l'Allemagne a fait de la pression pour BioNTech ou est-ce que la France est intervenue pour... Euh, son entreprise nationale euh, et comment ça s'est déroulé au niveau de la présidence allemande. Merci. Merci. Stéphane. Merci. Pour la première question, est-ce que nous avons, sur la critique, on n'a pas euh, commandé suffisamment de doses Je pense que j'ai déjà donné une réponse à cette question. 
quand j'ai essayé d'expliquer que la philosophie de base de notre stratégie, c'est d'assurer un portefeuille aussi diversifié que possible des vaccins. Nous voulons des vaccins de différentes sociétés, utilisant de différentes technologies, pour avoir plus de chances de trouver des vaccins qui sont en effet considérés comme sûrs et efficaces par l'Agence des médicaments. Donc, la philosophie de base a toujours été d'avoir euh, ce portefeuille diversifié, ce qui veut dire que nous n'allons pas investir uniquement dans une société ou uniquement dans une autre société. Nous investissons dans plusieurs sociétés. C'est une approche qui euh, a clairement été soutenu au plus haut niveau par euh, les États membres. Donc ça, c'est euh, une chose. Je tiens d'ailleurs à souligner que euh, le, le, le CEO de, de, de Pfizer a annoncé que le, 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 la cour, le 11 novembre, lorsque nous avons conclu notre accord, que euh, le, le, le montant que nous, sur lequel nous nous, nous étions mis d'accord était le, 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 la commande la plus élevée qu'ils ont déjà reçue. Donc c'est aussi important à souligner. La deuxième question, euh, excuse-moi, je n'ai pas noté, j'avoue. Euh... C'était sur, euh, les... sur euh... la manière dont les négociations s'étaient déroulées. Est-ce qu'il y a eu des pressions des États membres pour leurs producteurs nationaux Exactement. Encore une fois, l'important, excusez-moi, hein, encore une fois, l'important, c'est qu'on a voulu tous, commission, les États membres impliqués dans les négociations, créer un portefeuille de vaccins diversifiés. Et donc, ça veut dire qu'on doit prendre en considération plusieurs facteurs. On doit prendre en considération, par exemple, les manières de production. De quelle manière est-ce que les, les vaccins sont produits Quel est le budget requis pour faire cela Qu'est-ce qui est nécessaire pour... Euh, 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 développer les capacités de production. Quel serait le prix qui, est, euh, qui serait demandé par la société Quelle est la technologie qui est utilisée Et ce sont tous ces facteurs-là que les négociateurs, l'équipe de négociation a pris en considération pour arriver à des accords justes et corrects avec euh, ces sociétés. Donc, les, les, les seuls critères qui ont joué un rôle dans le cadre de ces négociations, c'est de créer ce portefeuille diversifié, prenant en considération chaque élément, chaque caractéristique de chaque société. Chaque société utilise sa propre technologie avec des inconvénients, des avantages. Euh, et donc, nous avons pris tout cela en considération pour arriver à notre euh, portefeuille diversifié. Merci. Merci. Euh, Patricia, aussi une question sur les vaccins. No, uh, ah. hi Eric, Happy New Year. No, Happy it's New... not on the vaccine. Okay, then hold your fire, please. We'll come back to you afterwards. Okay. Are there other questions on vaccines? Frédéric, I know your question is on something else. Very nice. Your question on vaccines. Please only keep your hand raised if your question is on vaccines. Push the, you know, re-push the button to unraise your hand if it's not a question on vaccines. OK, I see some hands have see some hands disappeared. Have... Verena, disappeared. You, have the floor. Verena. you have the floor. Hi, and Happy New Year for me as well. Thank you for the question. Um, I just wanted to get back um, to uh, what, what Stefan said in the beginning, because the BioNTech contract was actually concluded on, I think, in November 11th, uh, in any case, at a point where it was clear that it was uh, both effective and safe. And um, it has been suggested by BioNTech that you could have bought more at that point. And the question is, is that true? D did you forego the chance to, to order more at that point and why? Thank you. Thank you. Stefan. Hi. Um, I I'm not sure this is entirely correct. Um, it is true that you know, when we start our negotiations, Um, for most companies, uh, clinical trials had not yet started. And for those companies uh, for, uh, for which the, the vaccine trials had started, we did not have final results yet. So it's very important that we to, to acknowledge that we work in, a, in an environment of uh, um, um, scientific uncertainty, I would say. I would also like to draw the attention to the fact that for us, the main criterion to go ahead with a vaccine is the green light from the European Medicines Agency. These are the scientists who, whose role is to really assess and check thoroughly the safety and the um, effectiveness of the vaccine. 
when this independent agency gives the green light, the Commission can then go ahead with its authorization. So um, I would not agree with the fact that there was already certainty um, before this stage. We wait for the scientific approach of EMA, which has always been considered as a very important step by the Commission and by the Member States, not just to ensure the safety, but also to show to the European citizens that the vaccinations that they are taking are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Hans. Yes, thank you, Hans von der Bocher from Politico. Happy New Year to you all. Um, Stefan, just to follow up on what you said on the diversification of the portfolio, I get your argument that you're saying it's good to put uh, the eggs in different baskets. However, uh, wouldn't, have, wouldn't it have been wiser to put uh, just have more eggs at the um, disposal and put more eggs in the different baskets because uh, for the Moderna vaccination, uh, vaccine, for example, we will only have 160 million, I think, that is going to be approved, hopefully, in the coming days. Um, so in, in, in general, uh, considering the high economic costs of uh, continued lockdowns, um, wouldn't it have been wiser just to buy more of all uh, these vaccines to have more at the disposal uh, when we actually find out which ones work and uh, what was the problem there? Was it member states not um, uh, handing out enough money or why didn't we just in general buy more of all vaccines in a diversified uh, approach as you described it? Thank you. Before passing the floor to Hans, uh, to, to Stefan, Hans, let me remind you that we have actually signed contracts that would allow member states uh, um, to get access to 2 billion doses. So largely enough uh, to, uh, to vaccinate the whole of the European uh, population. So the issue is uh, not really one of the number of doses. It is one of uh, the, the production capacity. And this is an issue which everybody is, um, is uh, facing. But I pass the floor to Stefan if he has further details. Um, I think Eric, what you said was, was indeed very important here. I can only say again that it, we want to invest in different companies using different technologies. And I would like to stress also the fact that what I've already done before, that we were working in a context of uncertainty. Up to as late as end October, there were still certain scientific experts who were skeptical on RNA, RNA vaccines. So we were working in such an environment of uncertainty and again to spread this we had to spread the risk or rather to increase the chances to have successful vaccines we felt it important to have um, these different eggs in our basket which as eric said has led up to a reservation of almost two billion uh, doses which is uh, quite an important amount especially if these vaccines would be considered all of these vaccines would be considered safe and effective let me remind you that this negotiation was done by the Commission with the member states, uh, taking into account, of course, also the wishes of member states uh, and uh, their understanding of the advantages and different disadvantages of different, um, of different technologies, of different uh, contracts, etc. So, um, you know, the, the, the exact scope of each of the contract is something that takes into account the balance of all these uh, characteristics that have been put forward and described by Stefan. Okay. Um, Louise. Louise, you have a question Hello? on vaccines. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Now, I was just wondering, in the contracts with the with the companies, is there not any kind of clause or anything that they actually have to um, maybe not split their patent on the on the um, on the, the active do on the active um, matter, but maybe license in other vaccine facilities so you can act so they could actually you know um, step up the the vaccination doses made or. Is there any kind of pressure from the Commission for them to sort of, you know, yeah, get the, the production done faster by using other companies, maybe? Thank you. I think it's, um, it's, it's a very tricky question to actually outsource the production of a vaccine to different uh, production facilities. You know, these are not fruit juices that you bottle 
um, from uh, and with all respect uh, to the producers of fruit juices because we want them fresh and we want them obviously to be very tasty so it's not easy either but when you're talking about very sophisticated vaccines you just don't st uh, don't shift production from one capacity to another and of course we are working with the producers uh, in order to um, to uh, help them increase production capacity. And as a matter of fact, as uh, Stefan said it in his first intervention, if I remember well, we were actually one of the first to invest, for example, in BioNTech or, uh, for example, in CureVac, as the German government did, in order to, um, to uh, increase production um, capacity. Jillian. Question. Happy New Year. Um, I have two quick questions about the vaccines, of course. Um, BioNTech has said that, that um, the EU will get 12.5 million doses by the end of 2020. I was wondering if that, if they've made good on that um, promise. Um, I was also wondering, you know, there's a bit of a blame game going on right now between member states and the Commission, of, you know, whose fault, or at least, you know, member states, some like Germany are saying that, that it was the Commission for not um, purchasing enough of these BioNTech Pfizer vaccines. But I'm also curious, and France has been very delayed in, in rolling out these vaccines. The Netherlands is just beginning today. I mean, I'm, I'm curious if you have any comment on that. Do you, do you feel like one of the big issues here is really that European countries did not prepare enough to vaccinate? Thank you. Stefan. Um, thank you very much. As far as the exact number is concerned that has been delivered to the different uh, member states, I don't have the different uh, exact numbers per member state. You may wish also to, to contact uh, the colleagues from, uh, from the company to see what has been delivered at exactly what moment in time to the member states. As far as the vaccination, uh, in the vaccination campaigns are concerned in the member states, I can only say that, what, uh, refer to what I said before, that already mid-October, we have adopted recommendations helping member states to prepare themselves for the uh, vaccination campaigns. This is an, uh, a topic which is discussed between the member states, for instance, in the context of the Health Security Committee, and where member states um, discuss with each other the state of play, um, how to take things forward, and so on. Uh, I would also like to stress that, as I said before, this is a very huge, complex undertaking. This is not easy, and so this requires a lot of good preparation. We are not here to see who did well or who did not well. We are all together in this boat. We want to make sure that the whole European Union gets out of this pandemic as quick as possible following good uh, vaccination campaigns. And the Commission stands ready, as you also know, to support member states wherever they feel the Commission support may be useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm um, going to pass the floor now to Michael. Michael Peel, you had a question I know Peel, on that question I know on that heat. I, I do. Uh, merci, Eric, et bonne année. Um, yes, I wanted to follow up on Hans's uh, question, which I feel wasn't quite fully answered. One approach would be to perhaps um, order a billion doses of every vaccine and then have an arrangement where this can then be um, sold on or donated on to other countries around the world who, who, who need them, um, or whatever is not, uh, is not used in the EU. Can you just be explicit about why that approach was not taken? Was it about cost, or was it because you looked at manufacturing schedules and you realized that um, it would not be possible because of those, or was it for some other reason? Michael, I think we are talking at cross purposes. The first thing to say is that the Commission did not buy doses of vaccines. As I said time and time again here in the press room, and Stefan as well, the Commission invested um, in different companies. We acted as an investor in order to provide funding to uh, um, pharmaceutical companies that were developing uh, vaccines at that point in time in order to help them speed up uh, their research, the development, and then their production capacities. Um, it is the member states who then decide whether they want to buy a specific vaccine and how many uh, doses of that vaccine. It is not us. That is very important to remember. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, as, we have, uh, as we have said, the issue is not the number of vaccines. The number of vaccines that we have is uh, sufficient and, of course, um, takes into account a European population and the other commitments that we, have, that we have taken. But ultimately, these vaccines have to be produced. They have to be 
uh, delivered, some of the um, logistical chains, um, uh, logistics chains that are involved can be very, very sophisticated. So member states have to decide whether they consider that one or more vaccine is suited to their needs. This is how the process um, works. So, you know, we could buy 10 billion vaccines if, um, if the member states, we can, sorry, we could have signed contracts for purchase by member states of up to 10 billion vaccines. But if the member states ultimately don't buy these vaccines, um, then it serves absolutely um, no, uh, no purpose. So again, I don't think that the issue is really the number of vaccines. It is the fact that we are at the beginning of a rollout. Uh, you know, we're all judging this as if this campaign is over. In fact, the campaign is just starting. Let me remind you that um, uh, in the autumn, um, when we were discussing this, we were saying that the rollout of vaccines would start at the end of the year and progressively build up um, with the big deliveries of vaccines foreseen uh, around the month of April. So, you know, it's quite astonishing in a way to see that now we are all turning around and saying, why are not all of the doses of vaccines already present on the market? It has always been clear from the beginning that we were developing a portfolio with the results of the strategy, of course, depending first and foremost on the assessment that would be made by EMA based on uh, the clinical trials done by the, by the companies, and that progressively these vaccines would come on the market. This is the phase that we are in now. The first vaccines uh, are being approved. They're going to be put on the market. The EU is getting the doses that it has a reserve where it has a possibility to do so. It is exercising the options that it has or even negotiating for further, uh, for further doses so that member states can then decide which ones to deploy um, in their population. Okay, um, are there other questions on vaccines? Patricia, you know your question is on something else. Uh, Frédéric as well, so I will come to you later. Francesco, is it a question on vaccines? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Good morning and uh, happy new year. Um, yeah, it's two questions. The first is a follow up to a question from uh, my one of my colleagues who was not answered by Stefan. Uh, it's a question about uh, uh, the Commission uh, having declined, the, the EU have, having declined to buy more doses of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine earlier this year. We know from internal from an internal document that there was an offer for 500 million doses uh, uh, back in July and uh, and uh, the eu negotiators said uh, you know turn that, that, that offer down because of because of because of financial reasons uh, so uh, we have never got a, an official confirmation for that so it would be great if uh, stefan could uh, 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 make a comment on that given that now it's relatively public and second uh, i have a, a second question on what uh, stefan said today he said that uh, the, the EU is uh, looking at ways to increase uh, uh, the number of doses that uh, Pfizer and BioNTech could, deli could, could uh, uh, deliver to the EU in addition to the 300 million doses already agreed. Uh, is this in conflict potentially with what Germany is doing? Uh, we know that Germany is ordering now uh, new doses uh, uh, of the same vaccine on its own in breach of at least the spirit of the EU joint procurement. So now we, we may have a situation in which the EU is competing with Germany to buy uh, uh, doses of the same vaccine. So are you discussing this with Germany? Is there a risk for a potential conflict? And has Germany offered you any guarantee that the new doses that uh, uh, is, gonna, is going to acquire from uh, BioNTech uh, uh, will be delivered only after the very last uh, dose of the 300 million order is going to be delivered to the US states. So the way there is a risk that Germany may jump the queue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan. Thank you very much, Francesco. That's not two questions, that's uh, six questions, I think. Um, first, as far as this uh, question is concerned, that um, we would have uh, rejected an offer for more doses. 
I can only say what I, what I have said before. We do not put all our eggs in one basket. The whole philosophy was that we want to have sufficient doses from sufficient number of companies to increase the chances to develop or to find rather a vaccine which is successful and safe. And that has always been at the core, at the heart of the negotiations with each of these six companies. So that's that's something that uh, explains why we have followed the path that we have followed, diversification of um, our portfolio. As far as these additional doses are concerned, um, you know that, um, as I said before, uh, as far as the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine is concerned, we had ordered or reserved rather 200 million doses and then the commission decided to exercise the option to reserve uh, an addi additional up to 100 million doses. Discussions are now ongoing, as I also said before, between member states and the Commission as to how to uh, take this additional this um, reservation of 100 million additional doses forward in terms of um, distribution between member states. Some member states may wish less, other member states may wish more. We have these discussions in the context of these additional uh, doses and therefore in the context of our EU vaccines strategy. When it comes to um, bilateral agreements which would allegedly have been concluded by member states with companies, I uh, invite you to contact the uh, authorities uh, of, uh, uh, of, of these member states about this. Um, what I only wanted to say um, uh, before, when I mentioned to the additional doses, this is of when, whenever the Commission considers the importance of or the possibility of going for additional doses. This obviously always takes in, takes place under the umbrella within the, the context of the EU vaccine strategy, because as we have seen before, the EU vaccine strategy is based on joint work, on co cooperation, which gives us the best possible approach to reach good deals that cover all the member states. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. I'm going to close the vaccine chapter now, which has been going on for three quarters of an hour. And I know that there are many other questions uh, which colleagues would want to ask. So I uh, pass the floor to Patricia. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so um, I would like uh, to know if the political instability and the risk of a crisis in Italy concerns the EU Commission more in general, and in particular, if this uh, concerns the EU Commission in, uh, in relation to the unfolding of the recovery fund. And I would also like uh, to know if you have some kind of a timetable of the ratifications of the own resources uh, by the parliaments of the different EU countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. As you know, um, we make it a rule not to comment on the internal political situation uh, in any of our member states, and uh, there are good reasons for that, so we will certainly uh, stick to this uh, line. We are cooperating with the Italian authorities as we are with the authorities of all, uh, all the member states on all the political files that we must master together. On the issue of the uh, timetable for ratification of the own resources decision, I pass the floor to Balash. Hello, good afternoon and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Now, uh, Patrizia, on your specific question, I think it's worth starting this new year by saying that um, um, towards the end of the last year, a lot of progress was made in terms of uh, budgetary matters. We have an MFF, we have an annual budget in, in place as of the beginning of this year. And the next big step, as you correctly are referring to, is the um, um, entry into force of the recovery, uh, recovery plan. Now, for that to happen, of course, the own resources decision needs to be um, ratified by all uh, member states. That's the very last step to complete, but it's a very important um, step. Um, now, it would be difficult for me to give you a timeline since it is up to the member states to decide when, they, uh, when and how they wish to um, ratify the amendment of their own uh, resources decision. What I can tell you and what we've said before is that um, we expect um, this work to be uh, carried out um, at the latest by uh, the second quarter. Uh, of this year, which would allow us to uh, kickstart uh, the recovery plan, which is much needed, um, as you as you know. Uh, now, for the um, 
exact process that the uh, ratification of the um, own resources decision entails in the member states. I would refer you to the member states. Um, we know that this will involve uh, the parliaments. Uh, the procedure will involve the parliaments in, in many cases, but in, not in all cases. But again, for the uh, specific procedure and timeline, um, uh, the best would be to turn to the member states directly. Thank you very much. Patricia, you have a follow-up. Go ahead. I would like to know, I would like to know uh, where are we in, in regard to the national plans then? Is Italy uh, on time on that? Is everything okay in that respect? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marta is absent, uh, so I pass the floor to Ariana on this, uh, on this question, if she can provide you with an update. Ariana. Hi, Eric. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Happy New, New Year. I'm afraid uh, I cannot provide much of an update. Uh, uh, what I can say is that we remain in intensive dialogue with member states on the preparation of the national uh, recovery and resilience plans. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, this is as far as we can go for the time being. Thank you very much. Okay, we switch files. Thank you, Balash. And I go to Frédéric. Oui, bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui, vas-y, Frédéric. Oui. Bonjour. Vas-y, Frédéric. Bonjour. Bonjour, bonne année à tous. Um, so it's a question about Brexit and the internal uh, energy market. So as of 1 January, the UK is no longer part of the internal uh, energy market. The Commission mentioned um, uh, that this um, uh, that there was a, a new market coupling foreseen between the EU uh, and the UK. Uh, can you give us an indication of when uh, this new market coupling uh, will be adopted? Will it be uh, this year? Um, and the Commission also sent out a briefing saying that this new uh, arrangement will be less efficient uh, than the market coupling uh, used within the EU. Can you explain in what way it will be less efficient than the previous arrangement? Thank you. I pass the floor to uh, Vivian. Hi, good afternoon, Frederick, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone as well. So indeed, as of uh, the 1st of January, the UK is no longer part of the EU's internal energy market. And um, the uh, energy trades over electricity interconnectors between the EU and the uh, Great Britain will no longer be managed through the existing single market tools, such as market coupling, as they are reserved for EU member states, as you said yourself. Uh, I'd like to point out also that according to the withdrawal uh, agreement, Northern Ireland will maintain the single electricity market uh, with Ireland. Uh, when it comes to now for the um, new framework, we have agreed uh, between the European Union and the United Kingdom to establish um, a new framework for our future cooperation in the field of energy, ensuring the efficiency um, of, um, of um, cross-border trading. And this uh, new framework would, of course, be um, underpinned by strong provisions in the agreement aimed at creating a robust level playing field. Uh, when it comes to the timing of it, then, of course, we are working hard on making sure that we uh, make these things happen at the uh, earliest convenience. Uh, what we look at the, when we look in details at the agreement, then it will uh, establish also we aim it to establish also an ambitious uh, framework for cooperation in the fight against climate change, as well as provisions for cooperation in the development of offshore energy, with a clear focus on the North Sea. And um, when it comes to the separate agreement between Euratom and the United Kingdom on the safe and peaceful uses of nuclear energy, uh, providing for wide-ranging cooperation on nuclear safety and peaceful uses of nuclear energy, um, this is another uh, part of the work that we're looking at now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see that Frédéric has a follow-up. Frédéric. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Vivian, you didn't explain uh, why or how the new agreement will be less efficient uh, than the previous arrangement under the internal energy market. 
uh, because that is something that the Commission said in the in the Q and A that was uh, circulated uh, when the agreement was struck. So, uh, uh, can you give an explanation there, and maybe using a, a, an example, um, if uh, say there is a, a cold snap. Uh, and the UK needs to import gas or uh, electricity as a matter of emergency. Will EU countries be obliged to supply the UK market with energy or not? Frédéric, thank you for your question. We will come back to you on this. Um, it's a question that should be addressed by Tim, who is uh, currently uh, on a well-deserved um, holiday. So we will, uh, we will come back to you bilaterally with the answer to your, uh, to your question. I now move on to other issues, uh, and I go to uh, Nima, who had indeed raised her hand uh, quite early, quite early on. Nima, you have the floor. You need to press speak. We cannot hear you, Nima. I can hear something, but no. Oui, maintenant à peu près, mais le son est très très bas. Non, je suis de. Bon allez, c'est juste. Vous m'entendez ou pas? Oui, oui. Vas-y. Ok. La question, c'est par rapport. Par rapport à, en fait, Iranian government, the spokesperson says this morning uh, they had already begun 20% uh, uranium enrichment at uh, Fordu facility. Um, EU already repeatedly described the beginning of the 20% enrichment process as a sign of the end of maybe this nuclear deal, JCPOA. Uh, I'm wondering for uh, Peter, is the nuclear deal is over? Thank you. I pass the floor indeed to Peter on this. Thank you. I hope I could hear everything and Happy New Year, of course, uh, to everyone. On this um, latest announcement, of course, we have taken note of Iran's announcement. And <clears throat> before answering your question, actually, whether the JCPOA deal is uh, at the end, I would say that if this announcement is going to be implemented, the announcement uh, by the Iranian authorities, it would constitute a considerable departure from Iran's nuclear commitments under the JCPOA with serious non nuclear non-proliferation implications. Now, let me recall also the importance of avoiding any steps that could undermine the preservation of the nuclear deal. And here I would like to recall all the previous statements by all the participants of the JCPOA that they are interested in keeping this deal alive. And the deal will be kept alive as long as all the participants deliver on their obligations. Now, regarding this announcement, so far the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency has not confirmed the practical implementation of the announcement. And our assessment of Iran's nuclear program is based on actions that Iran has in fact taken and as they are confirmed by the IAEA. I'm saying this knowing that the IAEA has short while ago announced that the head of the agency will be briefing the member states later today um, in relation to Iran's uh, nuclear program. So we will see what the IAEA will say. And as I said, the IAEA is recognized independent monitoring and verification authority for Iran's nuclear program. And on its uh, assessments, we are basing our decisions and our actions. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Peter on uh, foreign relations? <clears throat> Noureddin. Ah, Niban, you have a follow-up, but quick, please. And also, we can hear you very badly. Go ahead. Tu m'entends, Eric, à nouveau. Désolé, je demande parce que c'est bon. Oui, oui, vas-y. C'est juste par rapport à ça. Donc, Peter, si au cas où euh, l'agence énergie atomique accepte, on confirme qu'ils ont euh, allé au-delà de 20%, pour vous, c'est terminé euh, l'accord nucléaire Comment va se passer 
Non, non, je ne voudrais pas euh, spéculer. On doit attendre euh, l'annoncement, le briefing des IAEA et après, nous allons faire le, la décision, le jugement euh, sur les actions suivantes. Pas de questions hypothétiques. Merci. Noureddine, une question pour Peter. Si tu veux. Bien. Ah, bonjour Eric. Et mes meilleurs voeux de bonne santé pour tout le monde. Merci. Euh, J'ai préparé mes questions en anglais sur la Libye et sur l'Iran. Um, in, uh, uh, in his report to the Security Council, by the end of last month, the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, suggested the deployment of the um, ceasefire mechanism with the participation of international observers. So my question is, what is the first the EU reaction to this suggestion? Second, will the European Union uh, take part in this observation or monitoring uh, mechanism and what could be the scale of the European Union participation? That's my question on Libya. I have a question on Iran, which is a kind of follow-up. If Iran is implementing what it announced this morning, this will be a double violation, one on enrichment level, second, the location where the enrichment level uh, uh, is, is going to be, which is the underground uh, nuclear facility in, in Iran. Uh, does that mean that the European Union, in case that Iran is implementing and confirmed by the agency, uh, the level of the, of the enrichment at 20% that the nuclear deal is finished and then European Union will move ahead with sanction against Iran? Thank you. Noureddin, I believe that Peter has already said that we were not going to go into hypothetical scenarios at this stage. So um, he, I, can, uh, I can only refer you to the answer he gave previously uh, to Nima. Uh, on your question on Libya, Peter. Indeed, nothing to add uh, regarding Iran. On uh, Libya, we haven't received, of course, the report. The report by the UN Secretary General was for the UN Security Council. But the European Union has continuously stressed that we are ready to increase our support to the UN to keep the ceasefire in Libya working as a precondition for any kind of political advancement uh, in the country and to develop a political dialogue. And the HRVP was very vocal many times that uh, the EU is offering its full support to the UN effort and to the Berlin process. In particular, this issue was uh, discussed uh, in depth uh, at the FAC on the 18th of November, where the HRVP again repeated our preparedness and readiness to support the UN in any way we can. And we are in contact with our partners in UN to see in what exact way we can show such support. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I see that um, Maria Psa had a question uh, for you on uh, Bosnia. Maria. You have the floor. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Maria Psara with Euronews, uh, a question on LIPA camp and EU Bosnia relations in general. So we saw HRVP's announcement on the LIPA camp and we saw the, that the EU allocates additional 3.5 million uh, to, for the migrants. So I would like to ask what the, the state of play with the camp and the situation there, if there is an, anything new uh, from this front, and what about the relationship between the EU and Bosnia and Herzegovina? What's uh, the status and if there's any, anything new on that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Peter. Thank you, Maria. And uh, indeed, the um, European Union, the members of the European Commission have been very busy over the last few days regarding the situation in um, Lipa camp or Bira camp. And in general, conveying the message to, uh, to the partners in Bosnia and Herzegovina that the situation in Unskosanski canton, in the canton Una Sana, is unacceptable and has to be solved immediately. We cannot wait. I mean, this is a humanitarian situation. Uh, this humanitarian disaster could have been prevented if the authorities would have been acting, as asked uh, already before the Christmas period by the joint statement of three commissioners. And uh, this is about saving lives of people. So we expect the European Union and its member states are expecting the authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina at all levels to take immediate action to solve the situation urgently. Uh, this is about saving lives. We are talking about hundreds of 
people in harsh winter conditions where their health and their lives are at stake. And uh, the authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina have humanitarian obligations, international obligations in this regard. So there have been calls um, by various members of the Commission, HRVP, urging the authorities to find solution to provide at the latest stage. I mean, the, the most recent call was to provide uh, supplies of electricity and water at Lipa camp. And uh, it's not only that we are asking Bosnia and Herzegovina to do something. We are doing our own share, considerable share. The funding announced yesterday is only in addition to more than 85 million euros provided since 2018 to Bosnia and Herzegovina to deal with the situation of migrants in the country. And what we are saying also that long-term solutions are urgently needed. And Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this is the message uh, and also answer to your second part, uh, to the second part of your question, Bosnian and Herzegovinian authorities should behave like authorities in an aspiring EU country. And people's lives cannot be sacrificed for internal political power struggles. So the situation needs to be solved immediately. The decisions taken at the highest federal level in Bosnia and Herzegovina need to be implemented now, these decisions about the, the camps and the situation of these people stuck in harsh winter condition, need, conditions needs to be solved because all this is negatively affecting image of Bosnia and Herzegovina at the, in the eyes of the EU member states, but also so on the international stage. Thank you, Peter. Nicola, Nicola, I think you have a question on the same issue. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I had a follow-up on that as well. I mean, uh, of the 3.5 million euros that was announced yesterday, how much of that is going to the Bosnian state? And you mentioned that the, the, the additional support is going to go help um, uh, the refugees and the migrants with blankets and things like this. So when exactly do you know, when will they be getting this? It will be like today, tomorrow, this week? And also maybe on the 88 or 80, more than 85 million that, um, uh, humanitarian aid that you've given to Bosnia over this, this issue since um, early uh, 2018, can you also give us a breakdown of how much of that went to, to the Bosnian state as well? Um, thank you, thank you so much. Well, let's see what detail we can provide you on uh, the breakdown of the figures, but this is more a question for Balash. So, Balash, go ahead. Indeed. So, the 3.5 million euro is purely humanitarian assistance. What does this mean? This means that we don't uh, provide this to governments. This always goes to humanitarian partner organizations. This is the principle that underlines humanitarian aid that the European Union provides um, to those uh, in need. Now, with this 3.5 million, purely humanitarian aid will reach um, 13.8 million uh, since the um, since the beginning of 2018. So we've provided nearly 14 uh, million euro in humanitarian assistance to uh, Bosnia um, in order to enable the country to uh, better manage uh, migration-related um, issues. Now, in terms of what um, the three and a half million euro will be used for, I can mention a couple of uh, examples for you, uh, which include um, uh, the. Um, um, buying warm clothing, bl blankets, food, as well as health care, or provision of mental health and psychosocial uh, support services. And of course, the funding that we provide will also contribute to efforts to limit the spread of the coronavirus. Now, in terms of the other components of the uh, overall figure of, of 88 million euro that Peter referred to, I think Peter or Anna can provide you more information. Peter, can you provide more information on this? Yes, I mean, we are happy to do it uh, also bilaterally. It has been published uh, as a part of the press releases issued over the last few days, so I think we can send this information. But the bottom line, I would really like to repeat the message. The EU has done its part. Migration is a shared challenge. We provided a lot of financial assistance, both through the partners, through our projects, to the Bosnian and Herzegovinian authorities to deal with the situation. And there are facilities on the spot so it's unacceptable that these people are left hanging out there in harsh winter conditions and the situation needs to be solved as a matter of urgency. Nikolai, short follow-up. Yes, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to know when um, these supplies will be delivered to these people. Um, is, it, is, it, is it happening now or, or when, 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 when will they get it? Thank you. Yes, so in terms of humanitarian assistance, the way it works is that we provide the funds to uh, humanitarian partner organizations, typically this means NGOs or uh, possibly UN organizations, which are then um, uh, to um, 
buy or purchase what needs to be what needs to be purchased. Now, on our end, um, we made the announcement yesterday, and we will disburse these funds as soon as possible. I will look into this further in the afternoon, and I will try to give you a, a specific uh, timeline on this. Thank you. Okay, I see one last uh, hand raised, uh, James Wilson. James. Yes, good afternoon. My, my question relates to uh, Brexit and the Erasmus program. Uh, as most people will know, uh, the UK decided to opt out of the Erasmus program. However, since then, the Republic of Ireland uh, very generously extended financial provision to enable Northern Ireland universities to take part. My question relates to Scottish universities, which for many years have extended uh, education free of tuition fees to students coming from the EU. And my question is this, would, would the European Commission look favorably upon an application from Scottish universities to remain in the Erasmus program, provided that they paid their own financial share contributing towards the program? Thank you. That would be a question, um, well, I'm not quite sure who now. Uh, let's see if Dan has anything to say on the, um, on the issue. Hi, Eric, and hi, James. Thanks very much for your question, and a happy new year. Um, I mean, I would just reiterate what you yourself said. The UK government decided that it no longer wanted to take part in Erasmus, which is something that um, we regret. Of course, we have seen the the news uh, in, in the press announced by the, by the Irish government. This is something we take note of. Um, it's worth recalling as well that the withdrawal agreement covers students currently on Erasmus and for, for the current um, for the 2014-2020 MFF, but of course, the, um, the going forward, the UK will no longer be part of this. As for your question on Scotland, um, this is a hypothetical question, and I wouldn't have anything to say on it. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take two last questions today. Anna, you have the floor. Hello, hello, and happy new year. Uh, I have a question about uh, Gibraltar following the preliminary deal between Madrid and, and London. I would like to know which are going to be the next steps, uh, if there is already a calendar for fixing the, the treaty. And I would like also to understand uh, a little bit more about the role that is reserved uh, for Frontex and when they could start working on Thank Gibraltar. You. Thank you. Done. Hi, Anna. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Hi, Anna. Thanks very much for your question. Uh, indeed, we are now examining um, the, the agreement reached in principle between Spain and the United Kingdom on New Year's Eve uh, regarding Gibraltar. I don't have a specific timeline to provide you with uh, right now, but we are uh, we are working on this and um, working on this within a view of going towards the Council to get a mandate to begin formal negotiations. Thank you. Last question goes to Oliver. Yes, I think you should hear me now. It says live on the we screen. We do, yes. Uh, can you, yes. Uh, fantastic. Um, d d what is your reaction to the EU Observer story, uh, the publication of a recording of, I think, the former KGB boss, a uh, Belarusian, uh, Belarusian KGB boss, where he talks about assassinating Belarusian opposition politicians in Germany. Does that change your outlook on, on the policy towards the Lukashenko regime? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. No, we have no comments to make um, on, um, on this issue, and our policy vis-a-vis -vis Belarus is very, very well known. We will not comment on, um, on this report. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings our first midday briefing of the year to a close, uh, and we will meet again here in the press room tomorrow at 12. Thank you.